Well, here we are. Welcome back. Come straight away to the big issue of the moment. The state-owned oil company, the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC, has in recent weeks indicated that it is on a mission to increase domestic refining capacity and guarantee energy security through a two-pronged strategy. The first is to plunk down $1.5 billion for the rehabilitation and upgrade of its wholly owned 210,000 barrels per day Port Harcourt refinery, while the second is to acquire stakes in private refineries across the country, chief of which is the Dangote Refining Complex in Lagos. According to the NNPC, both initiatives will be funded through a number of sources, including borrowings on the back of cash flows that will be generated by the refineries. Now, although the proposal may look good on paper, the national oil firm has remained silent on the medium to long-term threat that could potentially thin refining margins and the move that phasing out fossil fuel vehicles pose to the business of petroleum refining. In the immediate term, NNPC is also hamstrung by OPEC production quotas and the trillions of Naira that it is forced to expend to sustain a crippling subsidy regime aimed at keeping the price of petrol below the market-determined rate. Well, for more on all that, I'm joined now here in the Abuja studio by the Group Managing Director of NNPC, Mele Kiari, who oversees the operations of the state-run oil firm NN. PC. Good morning, Mr. Kiari. Good morning, Charles. Good to see you Good again, to see you, and to welcome see you. to the program. Now, what informed the decision of NNPC to acquire equity, if you like, in the Dangote refinery, and what percentage is NNPC aiming to acquire? Yes, just I think it's good to step back to see why would you even build a refinery in the first place. Uh, first of all, we see a number of uh, realities that are turning out, uh, transportation, power, uh, all other forms of utility that petroleum does to, to nations and to populations uh, are real. Uh, you can avoid it. And of course, you also need a source of doing that. And for a resource-dependent country, a very well-blessed country like our own, where you have over 37 billion barrels of uh, reserves of oil, over 203 trillion scope of gas, you know, you have huge resources in your hands that others need and you need more. And the key issue around petroleum is that you know, it must be close to that source of supply. The closer you are, you have safety, you have security, and you also have other benefits that are, are too numerous to count on, on this platform. So every resource dependent country makes effort to make sure that you add value to petroleum that you produce. Uh, that means you're capturing some of the value upfront and also gives you some security, uh, energy security in your own country. In our case today, we import 100% of all the petroleum that we use for the very simple reason that uh, we are unable to maintain our refineries uh, over the last period. I don't want to lament, yes, because you know, it's very true that uh, we haven't done well in the last 20, 25 years fixing our refineries and getting them to work. Uh, but the fact still remains that you are a net importer of petroleum, right? and that throws enormous security and uh, supply, energy, supply, supply, energy security issues for your country. So we, three years ago, we decided that uh, we have to expand our portfolio as companies. Not today. We didn't start thinking of the Dangote Refinery or any one of them's uh, mm -hmm. position of equity just yesterday. No. Uh, three years ago, we decided that we have to expand our portfolio. We need to spread our risk. That we cannot depend on the refineries that are owned solely by us. We need to spread the location of these refineries, the ownership of these refineries, such a way that at any point in time, we uh, guarantee energy security for our country. You have multiple sources of supply. You have controls that are very different from what you do alone. So uh, we decided that we're going to take equity in many other uh, assets. Today, NMPC has equity in ammonia plants, methanol plants, fertilizer plants, you know, so that we can spread our risk and our portfolio. And mm. particularly in case of petroleum refineries, uh, we believe that uh, uh, taking equity in any refinery that is uh, producing more than 100,000 barrels is, is the right thing to do, actually from 50,000 barrels per day. Uh, the key reason is that you do not allow entities of this nature in a resource-dependent country that relies hugely on uh, revenues and resources from petroleum for its, uh, for its well-being to allow a uh, private sector only to have that control. And no country does this. It's not done anywhere. Others have tried it. They have failed. Uh, they, they have paid price for it. And we have seen this coming. So we decided that uh, anywhere, anyone 
you know, including Mr. Dam, uh, Mr. Ali Kodamgote. And I can confirm to you, uh, he didn't ask for it. It was our decision that we need to take equity. We made this decision three years ago, much earlier than where he is in the refinery uh, process, uh, the development of his refinery process. I can confirm to you that uh, it's not what he wants. It knows it's not what they want to do, but they also are aware that they are operating in a resource different country. We made a request and with this policy of government that we take interest in this. So overall, what will happen uh, is that uh, uh, LMPC will have a seat on the board of this, uh, this, uh, these refineries. Obviously, sitting on a board with equity, probably, as you have asked, you know, how much equity would you take? Well, 20, that's always going to be my 20 question. 20% equity will give you a seat on any board of any company. Right. Is that what you're taking? That's what we're taking. Not what you see out there that we're taking 30%. or no, we're only taking 30%. We have not closed that deal. There are conversations that are going on with us uh, to clear issues around governance, to make sure that the term sheet that we have signed with them becomes material. There are many, many other governance processes that you have to take through before you take it to the mm -hmm. end. So it's not a closed deal. But it's a deal that we are, we are very hopeful, we are very proud that this will happen. There are some steps that are left, including getting the consent of the Federal Executive Council for the very obvious reason that uh, we are buying these shares on behalf of the Federation. And this Federation deserves some say in this. And Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of process, uh, we're taking this through. But, but are they in agreement with you that it's going to be 20% or do they want you to take less? What they want is for us to take less. Uh, what we need to see, because we are, we are very, very experienced in, in NMPC around what refineries do, what returns come from refinery operations. We have seen that this refinery, whatever you invest in, you know, I'm sure we're very sure that you can cash out your, your investment in five years, max five years. So it's a very, very valuable in investment that we have seen. Uh, in terms of scale, you have a very huge refinery that can produce up to 50 million liters of petrol alone. And that means that you know, if you don't have a say and you don't have an, an instrument where it guarantees you some level of the supply that will come from this refinery, you could run into trouble. And therefore, we insisted that it, can, it has to be 20% of the equity in this plan. And, and obviously, uh, this is not what they want, uh, but this is what we want is negotiation because uh, in, in, any, in any case, you can't force yourself into a private business. But uh, obviously, what they would yes, have preferred is something, something less. And it is a huge negotiation. We didn't start it today, actually. Uh, the process started uh, almost December last year, and it wasn't what you see in the media that oh, we just rushed and, and had a deal. It's a very elaborate process that we have to go through. Uh, th mind you, this is a very, very regulated uh, business. Uh, uh, it's a globally reg regulated business. There are things you can't do in this business. When you want to buy equity in any business in the oil and gas sector, there are valuation process, short of which banks will not put their money into it. We are borrowing to pay for equity. And that means that you have to follow certain basic fundamental principles in the industry who tells you, uh, your lenders that this is the what of this refinery, and they will find mm -hmm. out. And they have a job to make sure that they find out what the what is. So it's not what you see in the space out there that, oh, this uh, refinery is... Uh, yeah, uh, but of course, from, from, from the perspective of the private uh, sector that you're trying to buy a stake in, in their refinery in, I mean, they're, they're going to be asking, you mentioned there that, you know, you have a lot of experience in refinery things. I mean, they'll say that, you know, if, you, if, if you've got all that experience, why aren't you running your own refineries? That's the point I made. You know, I admitted that we haven't done well you know, managing our refineries. Uh, we have a different perspective today, as you rightly pointed out. We have issued the EPC contract for Potaco refinery. We have changed the entire model. Uh, the model is such that, uh, yes, we, the best practice is for you to get an O&M contract. What it means is that an operational maintenance contract to run your refinery, not to do it yourself. Yes, in many places you see uh, companies, you know, engaging third parties to run their refinery. For it's actually part of the conditions precedent for the loan that we are going to take that NMPC must hand over the operations of this refinery to an O&M contractor. Yes, we, we will use some of our staff to run it, mm. but obviously, you know, that structure has changed. And we know that uh, having that kind of structure, you know, will work. Uh, and that's why we have also seen the same structure happening in the Dangote refinery, very many other private enterprises that were taking interest right. in. Okay. So it's, it's best practice. So where are you going to get the money from? I understand you're, 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 you're going to put down some $1 billion, $1.5 billion to acquire these stakes? Yeah, we're borrowing $1 billion from a, a syndicate, you know, you know being uh, coordinated by the Afrexim. And they, you, I'm sure you all know that no one is going to give you $1 billion if they don't see a pathway to recovery of that cash. And I'm happy to say that uh, we're not going to use any government money to pay that back. Uh, what we're going to do is to pay back this loan from the back, back of the cash flow from this refinery. So it means that the banks will see that this refinery will make money. It will, it will also make uh, pay dividends that will enable us to pay. So we, we really see don't any trouble. And mind you also, 
there is a very, very special refinery in the first instance in the sense that uh, uh, you will see uh, massive volumes, change of flow of uh, the products from, from up Nigeria all the way out to the West Africa, probably reverse back into even Europe. Today, most of the products that we are getting are coming from Europe and the Middle East. And uh, we know that once you are able to get this done, get the refinery, well, there are a number of other initiatives that we are doing, having some of the condensate refinery initiatives that we are going to take FID very soon. And the combination of all this, getting our refineries to work, the Fotaco refinery also pulling up a process to put back the Kaduna War refinery. The combination of all this is that you are going to be a net exporter of petroleum product in a very, very short time, probably less than three years. Uh, if that happens, then you have to start looking for market. And looking for market means that you know you have to see how the flow of the product works within West Africa. Nobody, for instance, in South Africa, just as close as South Africa is today, they do not have all the production that require to meet their local demand. Mm. They import from uh, Europe and some other uh, further Eastern countries. As soon as you have that supply source in available in Nigeria, distance is shorter, safety of supply is much easier, and you will see Nigeria dominating the entire uh, African uh, markets, uh, particularly on the on the south coast of uh, Africa. Well, and, and this is obvious advantage. Uh, this is what we should have done, you know, maybe 20 years ago. Yes, lamentation, not good for any business, but I think that we have a line of sight around when this will work perfectly. Well, it certainly sounds like you're doing some forward thinking, which is what Nigeria has needed to do um, a long time ago. Um, you Basically, you need new refineries. You can't afford to build your own, so your best bet is to go into a deal with the private sector. That seems to make sense. Um, you also mentioned the refineries that are already in existence, that are owned by Nigeria. What is the update on their rehabilitation? You mentioned Port Harcourt refinery, you know, Wari, you know, Kaduna, all of that. It's absolutely, uh, we've made a very deliberate decision that what we're dealing with is not uh, turnaround maintenance. And there's a difference, you know, we all own cars, you go to uh, your garage, change your engine oil and kind of few things that you do and mm. that's in the, in the sense of a refinery that's really what uh, turn around means and some basic things but when you have a refinery that has undergone you know clear absence of uh, uh, doing the right thing for a long period of time so over 20 years of uh, not doing it right uh, it simply means that you are actually going to overhaul or maybe the what we call it we call it rehabilitation very many of the process plants uh, uh, have serious issues uh, we have taken assessment of what they look like and, and definitely at the end of the day you're going to have a, a refinery that will come back to its, not, not necessarily to its original form but obviously in, in, in the sense of science and technology that is something that will work perfectly over 90% of its installed capacity. So what did we do? Uh, we we, we followed the process that enabled us to award a contract, an APC contract to a very renowned international uh, contractor in this business. Uh, so that they can get this done for Port Harcourt. And at the back of it, we're also pulling through a process to award contract for both Kaduna and, Wari, uh, Wari, uh, Kaduna and, and Wari, yes. Uh, in the same manner, to a reputable international company, you know, I'm sure that you all will, all of us recall Nigerians that, you know, in the past, you know, the process of doing don this turnaround maintenance, maintenance weren't this uh, efficient, uh, weren't this uh, transparent. And, and obviously, we're going to end up with the best of class uh, contractors to, to deliver on this. So overall, the Kaduna and Wari will catch up with the Portacourt process because they will have learned from the Portacourt mistakes that we made so that we have hastened the process so that it will catch up. They will run concurrently. At the end of the day, we'll deliver all of them about the same time. We have also have a different strategy also. Is that uh, you don't have to wait until everything is done before you start a refinery. You, know, you can pace it. And this is the process that we have. So very soon, uh, as the contractor has already mobilized to Portaco Refinery, we'll do the same thing for Kaduna and Wari. And concurrently, we'll, as they run, you know, you'll see a situation where these refineries come up completion, maybe 40 months away, but obviously production will start much earlier than that. And, and that's how refineries are actually uh, rehabilitated or, or maintained. Right. So when can Nigerians expect to see production begin? In other words, Nigeria starts to refine its own petrol, its own oil, and people actually start to see it happen. Multiple platforms. Uh, let me start from the one that you started with, the Dangote refinery for mm. all intent. Now I can speak about it because we are very potential owners of this refinery. Uh, by 2022, it will come into st on stream. Then secondly, our refineries plan is to have full, complete rehabilitation, which means both the plant itself and the surrounding facilities to be mm. completed. Plan is for 40 months, but production starts in 18 months uh, from the day the contractor 
uh, mobilize his suicide. So, so it will it will happen in the life of this administration. It's not a political debt; it's a technical debt uh, right. that we know this is practical. Uh, we know this can be done. Yes, it may makes uh, it will make political sense to deliver it during the life of this administration. And I know that I've never seen this level of commitment from previous administrations. I've worked for this company for 30 years. We have seen how things were done in the past. And obviously, the pressure and the insistence that this must work uh, hasn't been this uh, significant. So, yes, uh, it will be a good thing for this administration to witness the start of this uh, project. And uh, we would like to see them take this uh, to the end. But, uh, but obviously, uh, we're not dealing with the political deal, which is completely a very technical deal. So it will work. And of course, uh, you get the downwater refinery to come on stream in 2022. And then, of course, we have a number of other smaller initiatives. We call it the condenser refinery initiative. This is much quicker, smaller, and of course, much cheaper plans for it to put in place. Overall, we're looking at uh, exposure of around 200,000 barrels per day uh, all, uh, for all the condenser refinery. We'll take FIU. Well, that was going to be my next question. Yes, that's what are the plans to take develop <laughs> those modular <laughs> and condensate refineries? Yes, so I'm seeing it as a package. Uh, where Nigeria is able to process every crude oil that is possible to do so here, and mm -hmm. then the balance, of course, you export it. So, uh, overall, uh, when you have those initiatives, there are a number of other modular refineries, you know, private initiatives, two or three of them are already running now, and of course, a number of them have been issued licenses which they could not make progress. And I'm sure you're aware of this. Uh, there are over 18, 20 you know, refinery licenses that have been issued, but in the yet you, know, you do not have anyone that is running except a few of them. And the reason is very, very simple. I think it's good to connect this to the, the fiscal environment that you, 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 you face. Uh, today, refinery owners must tell them how they get the refinery at what price they are going to sell their petroleum. And then if there's a, any reason why they could sell less than what the market price is, you know, you must tell them who's going to give you the difference. And that's what kept people from not investing more, much more than anything else. Banks will not lend you money if they can't, you can't tell them how you can recover your cost fully. So I'm aware that uh, the ongoing process of the petroleum industry bill will ensure that at the end of the day, there will be a framework that will enable refinery owners to recover their full cost uh, from their operations. Uh, once that is assured, you'll see much more, that, much more that, uh, process come up. We're running out of time, mm -hmm. obviously, uh, in the sense that uh, the whole world is transiting. Uh, you must make some of these decisions now. You must monetize some of the resources that you Absolutely. have now. And obviously, if you don't do that, you, know, you run into huge trouble. So let's, let's move away. I mean, you, you've dealt with the issue of refineries, I think, most comprehensively. And um, anybody who's scribbling, making notes like I am, would, would see that, that you, you've kind of moved forward. I mean, the point, of course, is that you, you've set it out very well. The issue is, which has always been the issue in Nigeria, is that those timelines are met and people actually s try to see a difference. But in terms of the way that it's been set out, it sounds very comprehensive and very interesting indeed. But let's move away from that and talk about another nettlesome issue, um, which is the alleged NNPC zero remittance to the Federation account um, for June. Um, what is the update on that? I think just the, the key issue is uh, there's a lot of miscommunication around this. Uh, what do you hear in the media or what was uh, obviously some documents that were flying around social media of what we communicated to the Accountant General of the Federation is a very right. simple process <coughs> issue. Uh, we have an obligation every month to give a forecast of uh, what the revenue flow will look like for the next three months. So when you look at your costs and the revenues that you make, you can easily say that I, I don't think if I meet all my costs, I will have any much money to give back to the Federation account. But getting money to the Federation account is far more uh, complex than what you see NMPC making returns to the Federation account. For instance, uh, you must produce oil before you can pay petroleum profit tax and pay royalty. So our biggest tax as the national oil company is pretending over 80% of the production that goes on in this country through all forms of partnership that we have, sole risk, partnership, some, some uh, production sharing contracts, service contracts, the joint venture arrangements that we have. Overall, we account for about 80% of the total oil production in this country. So our first job is to make sure the production activities work both for oil and gas right. through investing, through engaging, through making decisions with our partners. Once you do this, your partners are also able to pay their taxes and their royalties. You are also able to recover taxes and uh, royalties from government's own production. So that's the first line of uh, revenue stream. Now, what is called the NMPC remittance repatriation worker is the, the value that comes up from our own operations on behalf of the Federation, not what our partners do. 
And the meaning of this is that uh, you have cost. You know, we are paying for cost of production. You take up that from your gross revenue. And then, of course, then the, the big elephant in the house. Uh, today, we are selling petroleum at 160 naira to the liter, and the market price is 256. For instance, just three days ago, I just cross-checked that. If you, have, if you decide to sell at market price, you know, you probably will be selling at 256. Mm. But we understand the issues. Uh, uh, why we can't do the 256 today there are engagements that are going on within us and organized level civil society organizations the governors forum are very many other institutions that are involved in this to make sure that uh, we have a fully regulated market market environment. but we're not there we understand the realities we also see the concerns particularly of mr president that we should not put pain on the ordinary people uh, if we can avoid it and that right. pricing is everything and pricing, you can get it wrong if you don't have the right structure. You can actually put burden that shouldn't exist even under a fully regulated environment. That's the work that is going on to make sure that those burdens are not there. We're able to limit our exposures, particularly around the losses that we incur due to cross-border uh, smuggling and so on. Many things that are happening. So we're containing this. We're engaging. We're acting. Uh, and ultimately, we'll see the, la the, the best framework that will enable that to happen. Once that happens, uh, you will now see some of these revenues that you won't see. What will uh, probably account for the zero returns that you have seen in the media will vanish. For instance, by law, we are expected to deliver at least uh, 120 billion naira of net cash flow into the Federation account. We are not able to do this in the last four months. A uh, very simple reason is that the net cash flow is impacted by the, the, the very realities of the uh, the of the subsidy regime that we are operating on behalf of all of us and and un until you take that out you're not going to see that full-blown uh, revenue stream but our main tax is to make sure that we continue to uh, provide the production that uh, provides us the all the petroleum profit tax and all the royalties as the first line of revenue that you have everything else is secondary so nmpc's direct contribution is very marginal most people don't understand this but our job is to make sure that this industry runs and of course uh, many other things come into play including delivery of gas to uh, gas-based industries, the energy engine, and so on and so forth. All of them, in a, in a way, uh, because our operations will continue to run, will make sure that value comes into the Federation. And people won't see this, uh, but what is obvious to all is that what we go and announce at the, at the FAC. Uh, we're very proud that zero doesn't mean zero. You know, zero means that you know, it's simply net of the direct cost that we have. Uh, that we have to deliver to the federation even if it is zero is not a problem but actually what you saw in the media didn't play out it wasn't zero in june and i don't think it will be zero in july thank you right so what was it in june i think about 38 billion dollars or so 38 billion naira. right well that's mm. not a lot of money is it? it's, it's not uh, because it's not zero yeah right but i mean you, you you do sound though i mean it sounds just listening to you talk as though nnpc is is overwhelmed we're not. Uh, I'm not sure that's correct. Uh, first of all, when you say overwhelm means you can't get things done the way it should be done. I don't think that's the picture today. Uh, today, this company is much more uh, open and transparent to its shareholders than it ever was. Uh, we have published our audited statement of accounts for 2018, 2019. I will do for 2020. Uh, so our shareholders know what we are doing. We are delivering on everything that we should do, including delivery of uh, gas projects into the domestic market. All our projects are running on course and on schedule and on course. We have put up a process for making sure our refineries are rehabilitated. It's running on course, it's running on schedule. Uh, we are not a negative re revenue uh, status. Uh, that, that means that, you know, this year I'm very confident that uh, all things being equal, our accounts will show that for the first time probably in our history, this company will deliver dividend to its shareholders. So. It's not a picture of company that is overwhelmed. It's a company that is transiting. It's a company that is making progress with behalf of its shareholders. And I think we will see with all a sense of, uh, with all humility, this company is doing great today. Yes, there are challenges, obviously. Uh, we're surmounting them. Uh, those challenges are very obvious in an in energy industry that is transiting to something else that is different. We're aligning with all this and we're making the changes today. Nearly 70-80% of all our processes are automated. I do not, as a group managing director, deal with any hard copy document today. And this is history. Uh, this is very abnormal. And, and of course, people wouldn't expect this. But it's happening. So it's not a picture of a company that is overwhelmed. For instance, today, I can assure you, you can just immediately after Nigerians can check this. Uh, today, when you go to our website, you know, every transaction that we have done on behalf of this, pro uh, this country or this federation and these shareholders, is completely published in our, in our web page, including our working documents. Our transaction between us and the Federation account is completely 100%. That's why you don't hear any questions around it because we really have nothing to show. So when you are overwhelmed, you don't do things like this. 
Right. So transparency clearly yeah. uh, a feature that you have adopted and done so quite robustly. Um, now, there's another issue, um, which is the, I mean, to do with remittances to the Federation account, yeah. and that's the impact that OPEC, um, the OPEC plus production cuts uh, potentially would have on NNPC's earnings. Uh, is there any hope that Nigeria will be able to ramp up crude oil output anytime soon? Because obviously that's related to the amount of money that you make. Well, absolutely. You see, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, it was a very conscious and considered decision for the whole producing uh, community, all producing communities, uh, in the sense of the nation, for, for mm. instance. When you say communities, it can, can become very local here. Uh, the community of countries and nations that produce oil come together and say, look, we if we continue to produce uh, in that level, there's nobody to buy, and of course we end up you know, destroying value. So it was a very conscious and informed decision that we should cut our production. And what COVID-19 did, I think it's very good to put this in context, was to take out some demand uh, from the market that may never come back. Mm. Because people's cho life choices have changed, uh, a number of things have happened. You know, for instance, we all know that people don't want to go to restaurants and so on and so forth. Uh, the net effect is that you lose less of transportation fuel. And that has taken out some volume out of the market inadvertently mm. uh, as a result of the choices that people have made. And, and irrespective of the fact that uh, OPEC did at that time, you know, the key reality today, now, even when you want to produce, you probably will not see the market and you're going to have that crash in the prices that nobody wants to see. So nobody wants to produce oil at below its cost. So uh, getting back to uh, pre-COVID level is still far away. It's uh, at least by 2022. You know, this is a conscious decision of the OPEC plus uh, cartel that we're part of. And so what do you do between now and that period? Uh, there are room for uh, increase in volume. I'm sure there are engagements that are going on now at the Joint Technical Committee of the OPEC to see that you want one more volume because prices are very high now. Uh, even the oil industry doesn't like too high price. But for instance, you know, when you cross $80 to the barrel, you know, it constrains your, your, your consumers. They will make choices. They say, oh, it's too expensive. I don't want to go out of my house anymore, so I won't buy the fuel. So producers are aware that when prices become too high, you lose your customers. Mm. And, and for you to do that, you have to bring it to a level that your customer can afford those production. And of course, also service supply uh, providers, uh, service companies, contractors, rig owners, and so on, everybody will jack off his cost. And ultimately, the increase in that value is really not of any much significance to anyone. So therefore, in, in the only way to pull down price is to increase production or in increase supply. And that's what's going to happen. OPEC is going to intervene to see how we can bring down those costs. So in terms of what value does that mean to us is that whenever such volumes changes are introduced, you know, it will be shared among all the producing company countries. You know, we may have a share of that volume um, uh, relative to our ability to produce. And, and obviously, so you see that growth that you can capture the value as the production is growing, even at current prices, you know, you are not able to produce to the maximum for many reasons, technical issues also. When you shut down an, an oil well, it doesn't mean that it's going to come back, you know. That's the reality of this business. And even where you have uh, a reason to come back on some of this, where it's still some intervention, it costs you more money and so on. So there are many complications, uh, but uh, obviously as the production environment is changed by the OPEC arrangement, you know, we'll benefit from it. Right. But of course, the, the other um, issue um, that you have raised, actually, in, in, in the last year or, or so is, and, and that obviously impacts on, on the amount of money you make, is, is the cost of producing a barrel of oil in this country relative to other places like Saudi Arabia um, and, and so on. And, and the way to, I think, that you posited to do that was to embark on sort of cost-cutting measures, um, uh, including sort of the joint venture and production sharing contracts, you know, with partners and so on. To what extent has that been put in place and is it working? Yes, it did, it did uh, Charles. Uh, first, uh, we realized during the COVID-19 that you can't continue to produce at dot levels and still be uh, effective or also be profitable. Mm. Uh, so we decided, first of all, during the COVID-19 to ask our contractors that we can't afford this, it won't work, uh, can we negotiate our contracts? And it worked. We asked for discount in the excess of 30% from our contractors. And obviously, uh, it, we thought that they didn't have choice. Uh, rather than to do this, but we realize also that it is possible to do this with some optimization and ultimately we're able to get uh, 
reduction in costs in very many of our contracts. But is that a temporary thing? Because no, of it's COVID. not. It's not. You know, when we saw that opportunity, uh, we decided to launch another perspective, which is that we set a target for ourselves. Yes, I think we think it's possible to bring down your operating costs to a maximum of ten dollars to the barrel. Uh, and uh, we met our, our partners and engaged and, and ensured that it serves the interest of all of us to make sure that we bring that price, uh, product, that price to the cost of production to that mm -hmm. level. And we, we launched an initiative, we call it NUCOP. It's a nas it's national upstream cost optimization uh, project. What it does is that, you know, you kind of pull together all your cost sources. You focus on the areas that you are most vulnerable. You share resources, you share contracting processes, you shorten your contracting processes. You don't keep vessels that you don't need, for instance. You don't keep aircraft that you don't need, and so on, so many of this. And of course, our partners found this very attractive. Mm. And the end result is that we're able to substantially bring down the cost. I can't put number on it, but I know for sure that uh, we're able to bring down the operating expense by at least 30% of what it used to be one year ago. The net effect will be on the cost per barrel. So, but what's the cost per barrel really? You know, you have to produce the oil. There's, you have to sell it at a price. Right. And and that volume, as long as that volume is challenged, uh, which is the situation that we are facing today, and even if the prices are high, the volumes are low, and and of course it it, it will have an impact on our cost per barrel. So we're working on three legs. First of all, to make sure that our production is optimized so that that value will come up. And of course, the international space is that uh, price is uh, optimized uh, by, by sheer arrangements that uh, manages uh, supply into the international market, which we are part of it. And therefore, when you have ranges of prices between 50 to $60, you're very comfortable at current production level so that that cost uh, estimate or the cost uh, expectation of bringing down your operating expense to $10 to the barrel will work if you're able to optimize your production. The price remains between 50 and $60 to the barrel. Right. And you're also able to cut down your cost by 30%. And all that they seem to work together now. And we're seeing the numbers are changing. And, and obviously, uh, we're proud that uh, this is working. Okay, let's move away uh, from, from all that and, and talk about gas. Um, because I, I heard the Minister for Petroleum recently talking about the, the benefits that could come from it, apart from the fact that it could be a bridge um, as Nigeria transits from fossil fuels. Um, it's a potential bridge, and Nigeria has discovered, I mean, lots of reserves of, of gas. I mean, not so much discovered recently, but it's always been there. But now they're, they're taking advantage of, of its presence. But gas exploration and production is an area with that you know there's a lot of challenges isn't there um particularly in things like gas supply transportation to the thermal power stations it's always an infrastructure problem isn't it how is that being addressed yes uh, first of all i think there's something that uh, we need to appreciate mm. um in the past and the oil companies are looking for oil. They are not looking for gas mm. in a country like our own. So gas is, wasn't the focus. And even by legislation, you'll see that all our petroleum legislations that are on ground today are actually focused on, on oil development. So it's almost oblivious of the reality that we're a gas country. Uh, for instance, the Deep Offshore Inland Basin Act, uh, which guides uh, our operations in the deep water and, and the and the production sharing contracts is simply an arrangement to produce oil. So very silent on what you do with the gas. So that reality, because uh, companies are not necessarily looking for oil, has made us pay less attention to gas while knowing fully well that we're a gas territory. Uh, so what changed? Uh, very recently, uh, I'm sure you're aware that uh, we declared year 2020 as year of gas. Mm. 2021, uh, the government declared that it will be the decade of gas. That means we are shifting our focus from oil to gas as the transition resource that we need, as the abundant resources that we need, as the vehicle that can deliver prosperity into our country. And for we show that we, we know we're short of power in this country. Very many other infrastructures are lacking today. Uh, enormous work is going on, but the fact still remains is that there's a space to be filled. And that space for infrastructure in terms of providing power, providing establishing gas-based industries, and very many other derivatives that can come from gas is very wide and it's not very uh, clearly not focused on. So this focus brings two things on the table. There's need to alter legislation to support uh, delivery of gas into domestic market, also monetization of gas in general sense. 
And you can't do this without the right framework. Because uh, companies will like to see when they invest their money, how they can get this back in the country. Today, there are a number of challenges they have said around transportation. You can't even deliver the gas to the users. Mm. And, and today, we are short of <laughs> gas. Uh, enormous users were unable to meet their demand. That means there's a deficit that is, uh, that is real, which is essentially around infrastructure and around the willingness to upstream to produce the gas in the first instance before you put it into a trans transmission line. So it is the work of government anywhere in the world to develop and pr put in place infrastructures that will hasten uh, growth, economic growth, it hasten uh, monetization of resources that are in your hands, and also to hasten uh, a removal of poverty. So that's why we step in. It is, this is a national com oil company, the company owned by all of us, by legislation every year this country pro that provides for what we call the uh, provision for gas development infrastructure gas infrastructure development funds and we, are, we know that that's not sufficient because it competes with other resources and other needs of this country and therefore what we did is to anchor on borrowing to make sure that this infrastructure can come in, in place so that we can put those backbones infrastructure on ground and at the back of the cash flow that will come from the tariff or from those pipelines uh, this is working. Uh, for instance, uh, we are working hard to deliver the, the AKK pipeline all the way to Kano. We are delivering and completing the OB3 line, which will connect about 2 billion scope of gas into the western axis and connect the eastern axis of the country. Once you do this, you have a Y-shaped structure that will make sure that accessing gas becomes much easier for every part of this country. And we know that doing this uh, it serves our best interest. It kind of makes make sure that we can put in up to 8, 9 billion standard cubic foot of gas into our network once that happens you will see the spiral effect which is to you will see the springing of gas bus industries provision of uh, captive power in many very many locations which is already happening and and ultimately uh, infrastructure development is, is the key thing the industry is engaging they are seeing the opportunities local investors are seeing the opportunity even international investors are seeing the opportunities. yes well and, uh, that that raises questions about that because I mean you made a, a very interesting point about the regulatory framework and and the legislation and uh, you're talking about investors coming in from outside which is an important element I mean if you want to boost your uh, infrastructure in the country. Shell um, raised concern, I think about last week or so, over sections of the petroleum industry bill um, that's at the moment in front of the National uh, Assembly. It said the fiscal regime for gas development as well as domestic gas supply obligations um, that are being proposed in that PIB would serve as a disincentive for oil companies operating in the Niger Delta. Do you agree with that assessment from Shell? I think they, they were making the comments. I haven't seen that comment, so I'm sure that uh, it was taken out of context. Uh, well, it's very the, clear. Obviously. I mean, it, it's very clear. They're saying that, you know, the obligations that are imposed on investors as a result of that PIB bill um, are a disincentive for oil companies. Yes, that, that's why I said it is probably looking like it's taken out of uh, context in the sense that um, uh, the bill they are referring to is the proposal that the executive submitted to the National Assembly, which was the subject of consideration of this National Assembly, of the Ninth National Assembly. Uh, from the point we submitted as executive to the National Assembly, a number of engagements have taken place, including engaging our key stakeholders, which includes uh, what we call the OPTS. Hmm. Uh, OPTS includes Shell. And I I'm I'm can tell you, I was the, I'm the chairman of the technical committee. Uh, we are led by the Honorable Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, but I'm the chairman of the technical committee on behalf of government. I, I was coordinating the activities and how this structure of this bill will come up. I know for sure that we have engaged extensively. Over a hundred amendments have been made to the original bill, which essentially to to ensure that uh, uh, those concerns are, are addressed, so that the fiscal environment that is available today, or as soon as the National Assembly passes, is very different from what we submitted to the uh, to the National Assembly up initial. So therefore, I think they need to wait and see uh, if some of the understandings that we have reached were actually. Uh, put on the table as soon as the National Assembly passed, I can confirm that uh, this is not what they knew. Uh, and of course, the engagements that we have done with our partners is clearly have taken, uh, taken on board. And we are conscious that we are very interested in making sure that uh, uh, gas development becomes the focus of the bill. Right. And um, let's talk about one other important thing. Uh, time is 
running out on us here, but it's been fascinating talking with you. Vandalism of oil facilities remains a threat to oil production, doesn't it? What, what is the latest data on vandalism and, and what is the NNPC doing along, of course, working in concert with the security agencies to, to try and put a lid on this? What I can say is that uh, is the vandal actions zero now? The answer is no. Then still number of infractions on our facilities, you know, in very many locations. Uh, is it different from what we know? Yes, absolutely. Today, the level of uh, vandal actions that we see is much less than five years ago or even three years ago. So there's massive improvement because of two things. First of all, engagements that are different, uh, engagement of the communities and those who have stake in this much different from what you know i don't want to speak about it on this platform there are a number of uh, clear engagements that are taking place that is making it uh, possible for us to have this much more clement environment secondly uh, there's improved en engagement of the government security agencies and the actions that they do hmm. uh, of recent uh, we are, uh, without talking about the details you know and i know for sure that the chief of defense staff is leading a team uh, coordinating with them to make sure that uh, uh, those actions where the vandals are not necessarily uh, activists then it is really a matter for the uh, government security agents to handle. And I know the, a number of work is going on. The, the spat is going down, and this is clearly shown in our ability to maintain some of our facilities for a long period of time but without any, any shutdown. So things have changed. Uh, obviously, are there still challenges? Absolutely, yes. So what can we do about it? The reason is that uh, part of the solution is the petroleum industry bill. I know there's a provision for the host community so that they can have greater stake in the activities of our operations. Uh, we know there are a number of interventions that are existing today, uh, all kinds of interventions that government has done over the last uh, 10, 20 years to see how we can get the communities uh, developed. Uh, I'm not sure it has uh, perfectly worked, but this third level of uh, intervention that is going to happen with the petroleum, I'm sure that we'll get more and more involvement of the communities in our processes. And ultimately, there will be peaceful operation in our areas of, uh, areas of operation, and, and we'll see much more decline in the uh, in the acts of uh, bandals. But mind you also, there's a much more technical issue that uh, sometimes is mistaken for bundle action. Many of the pipelines are laid 30, 40 years ago. They have deteriorated, integrity issues are there. We have not been investing in them. And therefore, on their own, under pressure, they erupt, they erupt but uh, sometimes the, the chief excuse is to say that oh, it is bundle action that took mm. place. But we know for sure that uh, these are being uh, handled by the oil operating company, including us. Uh, but it's a combination of all of this that you see people describe as uh, a crisis in the Niger Delta. But I think we, in a large extent, I'm sure anyone which is watching events in our country today will see today that uh, uh, things are not as bad as uh, it's being reported. Okay, let, let's talk about, you and I were talking about this before we came on air. And um, you had some very interesting insights, which, which I think would be brilliant for you to, to share with, with, with our audience. We we're talking about the phasing out of fossil fuel, which is clearly taking place. I mean, you're seeing all the summits, the G7, the G20, on their agenda, indeed top of their agenda, is always COVID-19 and climate change. Is that top of the agenda in, in Nigeria, as far as NNPC is concerned? I mean, global warming, where do you see oil in that issue as it's being discussed around the world? And what does that say about the future of Nigeria that is very dependent on oil? Yes, by default, uh, when the oil and gas industry, you should have your eyes on energy transition. Do Obviously. You? Yes, we do. Yes, of course we do, Charles. Uh, first of all, I think it's good also to describe what it really means. Uh, when you hear energy transition, uh, carbon neutral, you know, the, the common understanding uh, on out there is that you know, you're going to move away from fossil fuel into the renewables. No, that's not the story. Uh, you're actually being carbon neutral by making sure that the impact of your activities is nullified by your other activities that don't produce the, those uh, effect on the carbon, mm. don't, don't release carbon into 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 the cl into the climate so it's a balancing act and therefore uh, what we also know is that even in in 20 years 30 years to come actually 30 years to come the focus that we have is that there will still be oil and gas demand up to uh, oil demand of up to 100 million uh, 100 million barrels per day even in 30 years to come that means oil will continue to be relevant populations are growing economies are growing the need for oil will grow but how you use oil will change and also the best of forecast that we have seen around is that even peak gas is nowhere near 
the next 10 years to be somewhere around 20 years so gas utilization of gas for very many purposes from pet chem and all kinds of things that we do with gas will continue to to rise in the next uh, five to ten years so you are not seeing extinguishing of oil you are seeing the conversion of oil to much more safer safer use because the the needs are also also growing so as you do this uh, that's why you see countries announcing that we're not going to use petrol engines in the next 10 years 20 years absolutely correct but what you also do is that uh, uh, you're going to move into EV vehicles. Uh, EV vehicles, uh, uh, electric vehicles, let me call mm. it what they are. And electric vehicles will run on electricity. You have to charge the battery. The batteries are made of plastics. The cars component itself, many of them are made from uh, polyethylene products. So we know that uh, it, it means a conversion of the use, not really the uh, actually powering of the automobile engine. So that's one as aspect that everybody is focused on, or they stop using petrol, but they will not stop using petroleum. Uh, that means the need for that petroleum will continue to be there. Uh, the uses will change. It will have less impact on the environment. We're keen in on this for us today. But uh, the, well, the need will be less, though, won't it? I mean, because no, I if it was more, people are already producing electric vehicles. You, you'd be having de more demand. Yes, that's what it means. Uh, it, it means that when you say you're capped at 100 million forecast at in, in 30 years to come, mm. today we're already doing 97 million barrels per day. That means that growth in, in 30, 40 years is still less than 3 million barrels per day. If the needs haven't changed, if the world's technological you know, development haven't gotten to this level, you probably see 150, 200 million barrels of uh, oil pro uh, demand in the next 34 years. So things have changed. That means there's retardation in the need for fossil fuel over the period of time. But it's not going to eliminate first fossil fuel. It's going to change the use of fossil fuel. And that's why we come in. Uh, as a resource and doubt country, particularly gas and resource country, you know, many of the uses, uh, combustion of uh, liquid petroleum is much more difficult than gas. And of course, they're uh, much less friendly than gas. So we know that our focus must shift to gas because that will be the transition fuel. It is not, its, it's utility will not peak. Its demand will not peak probably in the next, uh, until in the next 20 years. Mm. So there's a space for us to utilize the available gas for us first to monetize this in the international market so that we can get value to develop our country. And secondly, in the short term, to make sure that we have adequate infrastructure and focus to make sure that gas is delivered into the domestic market so that we can power our captive power plants we have gas-based industries and many things that it can it can it can throw at us so it's really a transition that is beneficial to this country uh it's not going to eliminate oil but it's, we, we're also keen on the very fact that uh, we need to pay less attention to the liquids and pay attention to the gas and also take the steps that are required to make sure that uh, we fit into the realities of tomorrow yeah, but you're saying you need to pay attention. We are paying are attention. To it? Paying we are paying attention. attention. We are paying attention to it. We have a full pledge renewable energy division in NNPC today. Uh, it's making progress. We are, we are having partnership on solar power. We are also looking at some hydro uh, installations and also looking at meta gas to methanol, methanol to fuel methanol plants and and so many of the environmental initiatives. Uh, we are building them. Are, we are making progress on them. But as we run with this, you know, we're also focused on the very fact that the resources that is quickly available to us, the transition fuel that is available is gas, and we develop this as we move on on the, on the renewables. We know this country endowed also with the, the, the sunshine that is required for solar, uh, but obviously uh, as you, you need to invest in that, that you need to have the resources. So only the resources that's coming from gas can build those resources for you to build on it. So basically, can it be said, I mean, you've set these things out comprehensively, articulately. Um, but again, you know, these are words. Obviously, it's the actions that matter. But, but can we now say, can you say to the Nigerian people that looking forward at a changing world, NNPC is no longer going to be the oil company of Nigeria, but the energy company of Nigeria? Mm. Absolutely. Our focus. Thank you, Charles. I, I didn't think of this. Uh, I thought I would say it last. Uh, but obviously, this company is transiting to become an energy company. An energy company doesn't mean an oil company anymore. I'm sure you have seen all these trends that you've seen all over the world around what oil companies can do. You know, it's actually they are now becoming investor companies. Mm. You know, invest in everything that works where the world is moving to today. Uh, we are empowering our telecom sector, uh, IT sector, in, within our company to have alliances that will make us take space in, uh, uh, occupy some of the space that is available in the IT world. And, and this is real. Uh, we had an advantage uh, 20 years ago that we didn't utilize. We have the largest optic fiber network in the country. Mm. Uh, that didn't, we didn't combat it into value. This is what we are doing now to combat that into value so that you know, we become the, the major uh, provider of trunk uh, 
uh, optic fiber lines and uh, very many more things we are doing. Just, just giving an example. So we are moving from being a necessarily an oil company today an energy to an energy company. And for you to do this, uh, you must see the realities around us. The work that is going on, the renewables, the electric vehicles, you know, uh, the carbon zero initiatives and so many things that are happening that we are keyed into a party to many of these understandings and agreements. And our partners recognize this as we do this, you will see gradual shift towards uh, uh, the reality is that uh, a national oil company must be an energy company. An energy company must provide energy of all, all nature. Energy can now be w actually widely defined to even include IT. So uh, IT is a source of energy of resources, energy of making uh, uh, prosperity available to people. We're very focused on, on this. So as we deliver dividend to our shareholders, we're also conscious of the fact that this company <coughs> will be an enabler company uh, which will facilitate growth and development in our country in a manner that uh, other international uh, oil, national oil companies are doing. You know, are we close to the Aramcos? Absolutely not in terms of the resources that are available to us. We have far, we have far less resources. We have much more different uh, fiscal framework that we have than, than Aramco has, for instance, and very many other national oil companies. We are doing better than many because of the size that we have, uh, because of the, the most recent of initiatives that we have in the last five, six years. You know, things are very, very different. And why people don't deal with us in the past is that they see us as a very opaque country and an opaque national oil company. And we're conscious of that. And what we did is to make sure that our, our transactions, our activities are, are optimized, our activities are made more, more transparent by way of uh, declaring everything that we are doing, allowing Nigerians to have access to data that we have. And, and doing this has also opened new, new roads for us. And I can confirm to you in our, many of our financing efforts that we make, you know, the key reference that they make is that now we understand you even if you are doing well, you are not doing well, we know why you are not doing well, we can see why you are not doing well, and we can work with you. And that's why we have seen a number of uh, interests, a number of uh, close out of uh, transactions that take, it easily could have taken us 10 years to do, we do them in a, in a split of a second. And I can give you one example. During the COVID-19, probably we are the only company uh, that is able to raise a billion dollars during the COVID-19 on a forward sale of a product that was selling below market. It's unprecedented, and, and the whole industry, I'm sure if you check, they, will, they are surprised that this could happen to us. And, and that means that uh, there's much more greater confidence in this company by the international business community. And we are representing this company as a company that is a company that is going to transit to be a world-class company uh, by its choices, by its performance, by its activities, and by the way that we do our business. I've just told you that you know, today, in the, in the group managing director of NFP does not handle any hard copy document. If you do, it's just by choice, casual documents, but obviously all our transactions that come to the group managing director are on electronic platforms. And that means auditing is easy. Anyone can check what we do. And, and, and ultimately, uh, your, your financiers, your partners, your, your other international um, regulatory institutions like the EITI, the EITI, you, you can just speak to OG, and he will confirm to you that uh, they haven't had it this good because uh, actually they know what we're doing. We have made it easy for them. Everybody can access it. They don't need to come to our office to find out what we're doing. The data that we manage are all in public space. Anyone can check it. And overall, that is uh, what an, an oil class, a world-class uh, national oil company should be. And it throws off challenges at you. Yes, you know, people will tell you that you can be transparent, don't be naked. But even when you are naked, you know, people know that you are doing it for the purpose that they can see what you are doing. It looks good. Thank you. Well, hopefully it won't be a case of the emperor's new clothes. <laughs> I mean, you know, but uh, I mean, you, you've, you, you've impressively set out a lot of things. I, I think one thing that one can take away from this conversation is that you clearly have a grasp, not only of the issues that are facing NNPC now, but the issues that are likely to face it going forward chief of which is the idea of converting it from an oil company to an energy company. Clearly, you're, you're, you're thinking forward. But just, we've got a few minutes before we have to wrap up. And you, you've been a very good guest and, you know, patiently answering the questions and so on. And we appreciate that. But let's just recap on some of the things, because a lot of what we've talked about is looking into the future. In the immediate term, what concerns a lot of Nigerians is the cost of petrol. They go to the, I mean, whether or not you're going to convert from gas to petrol, I mean, these are all sort of projections, but at the moment, they want to be able to go to the petrol station, have the price low enough, and the way that that can happen is if there's local production and all that sort of thing taking place. So just remind us briefly of what is informing your decision to 
first of all, acquire equity in, in um, private refineries and also uh, update us on the rehabilitation of, of the government-owned refineries. I mean, that's, that's the last thing that we're going to talk about. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Let me start with the last. Uh, first, um, we're expanding our portfolio. That means you are also expanding, you are spreading your risk. You know, when you are involved in other people's business, uh, you're taking equity in it. It, it. What it does to you is that you don't put all your eggs in. Let me put in Nigerian polar. You don't put all your eggs in one basket. So you are expanding. You are spreading your your risk as a, as an as an investor. So the first step that we're doing, looking at it, is look, why must we just be in one place? We can be everywhere. We can take small shares everywhere, and cumulatively, you have a one big share that you can you can, you can own. And that means if one of the businesses doesn't do well, you know, the other ca others can do well. And of course, overall, in a basket sense, uh, mm. uh, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are protected as a company. Secondly, uh, when you have a, a resource-dependent country like our own, um, with massive population, over 200 million Nigerians, uh, the last uh, stats that I've seen, uh, a, a, a middle class that is growing, and also you have a very young population, about 70% of our population, as I understand, is less than 30 years of age. So you have a challenge of security uh, going forward. Energy security is your number one challenge. I'm sure that we all recognize that anytime you have this small scarcity of petroleum product, you know, everything changes uh, in a very uh, pedestrian sense. I can mm -hmm. see that even your wife will remember that you haven't paid your school fees. So it gets this bad, you know, when petroleum uh, distribution is impacted. So you must be sure that your source of supply is guaranteed at all times. Uh, as, a as a national oil company until things change. Mm. Yes, market can, can take care of it. You can fully deregulate. But every country, including the most developed of countries, have a framework where energy security is guaranteed. They do hold some, some reserve. They do hold some stock on behalf of the state. Somebody has to do it. There are very different framework uh, that is done in very many countries. Right. But in resource-dependent countries, typically the national oil company does for you. So as a matter of energy security, you must be involved in these uh, processes until you're able to have a different framework. Right. Okay. Two reasons. Third reason is... Uh, Briefly. Yeah, yeah. And then lastly, of course, uh, is to to see that what do you do to become the world-class company that people can trust and obviously you need to be much more transparent much more accountable to your, your shareholders and of course you have to automate your system and process that people can see what you are doing you right. this can do and, and ultimately uh, the value will come on the table Mele Kiari, it's been brilliant talking with you thank you very much indeed and of course Mele Kiari is the group managing director of the nigerian national petroleum corporation